opportunity to worship you and we thank you for this morning as we uh, as we lift up our our worship to you and giving we pray that you would be honored and glorified through it and uh, that we would be blessed through our giving in Jesus name amen uh, if you uh, if you're uh, uh, here and you're a member of our church, um, you know, uh, and you would like to worship and giving, feel free to do so online. I, uh, I'm not seeing the toad. I guess uh, there's normally a toad out here out front for us to uh, uh, collect offering. But uh, if um, if you would like to uh, give to uh, the church this morning, uh, you can feel free to do so at BethelCovenant.org.
Next song is uh, "Is He Worthy," and uh, I think uh, I think we all have a sense that the world is not as it should be, not as God created it, um, and uh, that there's darkness and that there's evil in the world uh, that is trying to pull us away from God. That's trying to pull us in. Uh, the direction of the enemy, uh, just to keep as many people as possible from uh, knowing the truth about uh, Jesus Christ. And um, but I also know that we serve a powerful God who um, calls to us through His Holy Spirit uh, to bring us to His Son. And uh, so that's what this song is about. <laughs> He 
dust. And this Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those he loves. He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Every people and tribe, every nation and tongue. He has made us a kingdom and priest to God to reign with the Son. Is He worthy? Is He worthy of our blessing and honor and glory? Is He worthy? Is He worthy? thankful that he's worthy. I'm thankful for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, for what he did for us on the cross. I'm thankful that um, we have our faith in Christ alone. Since cursed as lost his 
his grip on me for i am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of christ Corey, come with announcements at this time. All right. Good morning, everyone. For those of you here and online, good to see or know that you're out there. A few announcements this morning. Um, if you are new to the church and or watching online, uh, please text the word guest to Elizabeth at 360 three two nine four three zero zero to get connected and to get a free drink from the koyana cafe um children 18 years and younger can pick up a free lunch any monday through friday from 12 to 1 at owls park uh, be sure to take advantage of that, especially let people know if they are in need, even if they aren't listening or aren't a member of the church or don't come. Uh, we just want to get the word out, so please let people know about that. Um, we're also raising funds for Caring for Kids. This is a program that provides backpacks and school supplies uh, to kids. Uh, last year, we were able to hand out 75 backpacks with school supplies uh, to all three uh, to all the schools here uh, in Bethel. Um, leftover funds uh, after the purchase this fall will go toward purchasing Christmas gifts uh, for children uh, during the Christmas season. Um, if you donate online, please select the option to contribute to this fund. Um, and this is the last week we're going to ask for donations, so this is kind of our last push. So if it's something you were meaning to do and you've been putting off, please uh, make sure to get online and do that this week. Um, for our time of prayer today, we have uh, a few prayer requests I wanted to mention. Uh, Teresa McIntyre, she just has an unspoken uh, prayer request for a, a struggle, a hardship that she's going through right now. So please be in prayer for her and, and be in prayer uh, for David Berlin's family uh, as he recently passed, uh, as, long, as well as uh, his granddaughter, I believe, in a, a boating accident here uh, this last week. So please be in prayer uh, for that family. Um, Grace Toss and Dennis Rains uh, are both recovering from knee surgeries. Uh, so please be in prayer for them for a speedy recovery and that they don't have any uh, lingering issues after surgery. Um, Chauncey Bailey uh, is having issues uh, with a blood clot and is hospitalized. Uh, so please be in prayer for Chauncey and also uh, the Platts. They are working on fixing up their house in Florida. Please be in prayer for them to be safe. There's a lot of uh, issues with COVID right now in Florida and just we want them to be healthy and safe. And also uh, we pray for, want to, want to pray for them for to have the help that they need to get their house fixed up and, and be able to return back here. So let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Dear Lord, we just thank you uh, for your love for us. We thank you that even in these uh, crazy times and difficult times, we know that you are here, that you are not far off from us. And um, as Job is experiencing and we're talking about um, during our sermons that um, 
there is a struggle in life and there are hardships in life and that um, even though we are going through those at times, we know uh, that you are never far from us, even though it may feel like you are. And so, Lord, I pray that you would remind us uh, even now that you are with us, that you have not left our side. And Lord, allow us to be even more and more dependent upon you. And Lord, we pray for the, the prayer requests that were mentioned this morning. We pray uh, for those that uh, were, were maybe mentioned online and uh, Lord, the ones that weren't even uh, verbalized. Lord, we know that you know uh, where people are at. And so we just pray uh, that you would lift them up this morning. And Lord, we just uh, pray that you would, uh, your hand will be on Fred this morning as he comes and, and shares the word this morning. Lord, pray that you would speak through him. And I pray that you would use uh, his message to draw us closer to you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Get situated here. <clears throat> I want to welcome everybody online and and uh, here in person. It's a beautiful day in Bethel, and uh, uh, it's a privilege to be able to share. Uh, I'm going to give a a message from uh, Revelation today, Revelation chapter 20, and uh, <clears throat> uh, before I, I start. With this, it's a. Uh, uh, I just want to acknowledge that uh, some parts of Revelation are very scary and they can be difficult to understand. And it talks about judgment and wrath and blood and guts and uncomfortable things. And so the question we need to ask is, you know, why should we continue to press on in reading and studying and learning more about what seems to be a kind of a cosmic book? And uh, the answer is given right in the book of Revelation itself. And uh, I, if you don't mind, if you could take your Bibles, and uh, I think uh, uh, Elizabeth, for those who are online, has the notes, and uh, you, can, you can see that I'm online somewhere, uh, probably Facebook or otherwise, uh, or Zoom. Uh, but anyway, let's go to Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. And, and, and what it says here, and it's just a single verse, at the beginning it says, Blessed is he, blessed is the one, I'm sorry, who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. So God is telling us at the beginning of the book that there's a benefit to be reading the book of Revelation and, and that there's blessing in it. And it's kind of interesting in the two uh, Two more recent translations of the of the the NIV to the 2011 version and the ESV both say, "Blessed are those who read aloud, read aloud the words of the book of the prophecy." So us hearing it and reading aloud, it, there's a blessing, and God, I think, wanted to encourage us to to press on in this book because there are important things that we need to hear in it. And then, and then at the end of the book, there's two verses that kind of speak along the same lines. And if you want to go to verse uh, chapter 22, verse 7, Revelation 22, verse 7. Revelation 22, verse 7. It says, Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. Blessed are those who keep the words of the prophecy book. So how do we know how to keep the words unless we kind of know what's inside of it. And then look at, look at verse, go oh, just a little further in 22 and verse 10. Revelation 22, verse 10. It says, and, and John is the one, through the angel, he's, he's, been, he's been shown what's going on, and he's kind of summarizing the book, and he says, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, because the time is near. He's saying, hey, John, don't keep these a secret. 
And why that, why that is so significant is in three different places in Daniel, which is the complementary book to this, to, to uh, Revelation, as far as prophecy and end times things, the three, the, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, Daniel is told not to, he says, seal up the prophecies. Daniel three times is told to seal up the prophecies that are that he's been told he was taught he was he's being relayed to okay he sees visions and that type of things and Daniel says seal this up don't worry about them they're going to be they're going to be coming up write them down but uh, uh, these are sealed up not pe people aren't going to understand them and now God is saying at the end of the book of Revelation he said he says he says don't seal these up and it's very interesting how uh, Daniel and Revelation kind of dovetail together, and now God's saying, hey, we need to be studying those things because the time is near. So, uh, <clears throat> so <clears throat> what I'd like to do uh, before I read Revelation 20, uh, I would like to just summarize what's happened in the previous chapter because I believe that 19, Revelation 19 is a continuum to Revelation 20, that they kind of go in a sequence. So let me just, I, I wrote a summary of them. I, I didn't think we had time to, uh, to read the both chapters. I love reading the scripture, but I summarize them, okay? And it says, <clears throat> it describes, Revelation 19 describes Christ's second coming Believers are described as the bride and the armies of heaven being dressed in white, fine white, bright and clean. So that's the, the bride and the armies are dressed in fine and white, clean, clean and linen. They come with Jesus to witness his punishment on all the wicked people on the earth. The wicked have aligned themselves with the Antichrist or the beast and, and worship the beast image. They've taken the mark because they have been deluded by the miraculous signs performed by the false prophet. Jesus kills, kills all who have taken the mark of the beast with the sword that comes out of the mouth of Christ, his Christ out of Christ, which is the word of God. It says the sword that comes out of, of, of the uh, ancient of days, God, Jesus, is, it's, it's the sword of the spirit, and it comes out of the mouth, and it destroys the people, and all the people that are killed are destroyed, are, are consumed by birds, okay? So that's all the wicked, because the righteous are with God. They're come with him during that second coming. They're snatched up with God. And so that's what happens in the, in, in the previous chapter. A lot of gore and uh, a lot of things, but the wicked are destroyed when Jesus comes. And uh, the, the birds gorge themselves on the flesh. That's what it says. So let's read... Let's just take the time to read. This is kind of good news after all that. Let's read the good news. of. We're just going to read 10 verses in Revelation 20. Okay? So Revelation 20, verse 1 through 10. It says, I saw an angel coming out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations until the thousand years are ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or received or his image, and had not received the mark on his forehead or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. After the thousand years is over, <clears throat> uh, oh, I'm sorry, verse 5, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sand of the seashore. They march across the breadth of the earth and, and surround this camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from, from heaven and devoured them. 
And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of the burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So I think what we need to do and, and kind of breaking this chapter down, th this chapter down is we want to find out, and I think there's a, lot, a great deal of confusion about who is these people that are taking part of the great, revel the great, the, the uh, millennial pe period. Who are these people? And it describes it in the first, uh, starting in, in verse four of Revelation. And I think if we kind of find out who's there, we're gonna find out a lot more about who we are in Christ. And so, first of all, look at Revelation 24 and the first part of it. It says, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, right? It says, I saw thrones in which, and, and so there's a group of people that are on thrones and they're judging. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to take other scripture to kind of give us some hints, some clues, because that's how we understand scripture is taking scripture to other scripture to kind of bring it in like a, a jigsaw puzzle to understand it better. So and look at, look at Revelation 3.21. Revelation 3.21. It says, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to, to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So what does that say? It says we as believers are going to be sitting on thrones. And, 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 and we need to be overcomers because it says Jesus was an overcomer. And as, we, as he was an overcomer, we are an overcomer. And it says, to him who overcomes, I have given the right to sit with me on the, tr on the throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on my throne. So, well, that's part of the picture. People, the believers are on thrones. And we as a believer, we're going to be with him. And look at uh, first, first Corinthians chapter 6, 2 through 3. First Corinthians chapter 6, 2 through 3. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to tr judge trivial cases? Do you not know that you will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? So Paul says, hey, this is, this is future tense. You're going to be judging angels. He's trying to keep the Corinthians from going to lawsuits against each other. He says, hey, why, you know, you're going to be judging angels. Why are you going to court to get against each other? Work it out. And so it's, there's two things there. When we saw in Revelation 24, he says, I saw there were thrones in which were seated those who have been given authority to judge. We got the thrones, and we've got a, a place where believers will be in the future judging even angels. Okay, let's go at Revelation and see this second group of people that are going to be there. And it says, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had given authority to judge. And look what it says after that. And it says, and I saw souls of those who be beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on, his, on their foreheads or their hands. So some folks get really confused when they start looking at this verse 4 and and uh, one second. and and they try to make it that a special group of believers that have suffered a little bit more than everybody else uh, are only entitled to this time being uh, the thousand years and I would like to 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 uh, suggest that that is not the case of all and that uh, that this description of these people that come out of the great tribulation that last three and a half years that don't take the mark of the beast these folks these these folks are kind of like a date stamp or a time stamp or what I would call an inclusion clause and saying that all believers are going to be there including those that have coming out of the great tribulation and and it's letting us know who all is going to be there and the and 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 the inclusivity of it all. So let's go on and go to Revelation um, 
24 again, and it says, they came to life and they reign, they came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And where else in the Bible can we talk about reigning? Believers reigning. Look at look at uh, 2 Timothy 2.12. 2 Timothy 2.12. It says, if we endure we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. So there's a promise there that if we endure with God, he's going to give us opportunity to reign. And look at Revelation 2.26. I'll try to be a little slower on going to the first to verse. Revelation 2.26 and 2.27. He says, To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with the iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I received authority from my Father. So, he wants to give us authority. And this is future tense, right? So, it sounds like we're going to be involved in this thousand years. Let's go to still another place. And it talks about... Uh, uh, us being priests in this passage. Look at Revelation 20, verse 6. Revelation 20, verse 6. It says, Blessed are the holy that those who have a part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with them a thousand years. Notice that reigning is still in there. But let's take a look at where some other places in the New Testament it talks about who are priests. And he talks about us. Look at 1 Peter 2.5. Go to your Bibles, 1 Peter 2.5. 1 Peter 2.5, he said, But you are a chosen people. Oh, I'm sorry, 2.5. Oh, no, I got, I got it mixed up. 2.5, it says, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering sp spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So what that tells me is he's in the process. If you look at the tense of that, he's in the process of making us this priesthood. And, and, and then look at, go just a couple more verses down to 1 Peter 2.9, and it says, but you are a chosen, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into wonderful light. Does it sound like that, that job description of priests reigning with God is part of our job description as believers? Let's go also to Revelation 1, 5, and 6. Revelation 1, 5, and 6. It says, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be glory forever, to, be, to serve his God and Father, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. So again, we are priests. And then finally, Revelation 5.9, it says, And they sang a new song, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, because you purchased men for God from every tribe, language, and people and nation, and you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on earth. So, do you kind of get my gist is that these, these thousand years, we're going to be there. And uh, we're going to be working and judging things that no eye has seen, no mind has conceived. We'll probably be judging the secrets of men's hearts as well. Those people that did make it. Now... When we talk about being priests, let's just look at what that kind of means. And if you go to Malachi 2.7, it says, For the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge, and from his mouth men should seek instruction, because he is a messenger of the Lord Almighty. 
So, the lips of a priest, and if we're a priest, we're, we're, <laughs> we're to preserve knowledge. In our lives, we preserve knowledge, okay? And people watching us to see, are these people authentic? Are they living out their walk with Christ? And uh, <clears throat> look at Hebrews 5.1. Hebrews 5.1. It's talking about the high priest at this point. And it says, the high priest is appointed to represent them in matters related to God. He's talking to the people about the people and what the high priest does. And of course, Jesus is our high priest, but I think about, I think about what Moses did. And you remember when Moses came out off the mountain and uh, he was really upset and he saw the Israelites while they were gone, they built this nice golden idol and they turned from God and they were doing things they shouldn't do. They were having a big party. And, and Moses threw down the Ten Commandments and, and, and God even said to Moses, he said, Moses, you know, uh, I can take all these people out and, uh, and I'll start new with you. God said that. But I believe that that was a test for Moses to see if he would stay with these people and intercede for them. And you know what Moses said? Moses said, Not, don't blot their names out of the book of life, blot mine out. So what can we learn from Moses there? Moses was around people that were messing up regularly, right? People were messing up. And Moses stuck with them and he prayed for them and he didn't give up on them and he, and he brought people as far as they could go. Many of them didn't go to the promised land. But he stuck with it. And are we going to be there for people that are messing up all the time? Are we going to be praying for people? Are we going to be God's representatives as priests? Because that's what God wants us to be. So uh, let's go on and let's just summarize what a priest does. In the Old Testament, I summarized it. It says um, we, we should know God's word well enough to be able to relate it to others. We are to produce blessings in the name of the Lord, to practice and administer justice, to preserve knowledge, and to proclaim the gospel of God and be a representative in matters related to God. So are we being the intermediary? Do we see ourselves as, as ambassadors working here, being placed on earth to be kind of God's representative to other people? In a very humble way, of course. Not a Bible-thumping way. Okay, now let's just talk about who isn't going to be there during that thousand years. And so let's go back to Revelation 1, 21 through 3. It's the beginning of the chapter. And it says, And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having a key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. Revelation 1. And it says, he sees the dragon, this angel sees the dragon, that ancient serpent who is called the devil or Satan and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years are ended. <coughs> After that, he must be set free for a short time. So, where Satan is abyss. And you may say, well, what's the abyss? What's this all about? Well, that, bit, that word is used nine times in the, Old, in the New Testament and seven times in the book of Revelation. And I'll just give you the quick and dirty on it. It is called the abode of the dead or the demons. The abode, I mean the house of the, house of the dead or demons. And that's where Satan is for those thousand years. He's tucked away. Got him, God's got him away. And, and to give you a, how bad it is in this place, remember when Jesus was met by the man that had all the demons. And Jesus asked this man, what is your name? And, and Jesus said, Legion. I mean, not Jesus, the, the man said, Legion. Jesus asked him, what's your name? And, and the man said, Legion. He replied, because many demons had gone in, into him. And, and listen this, this this part of the verse. It says, and they begged him repeatedly. They're begging Jesus, these demons that are talking to this man. And they begged him repeatedly not to order him into the order them to the abyss they did not the demons did not want to go there that's how bad it was <clears throat> so jesus what does jesus do he answers their request 
He sends them into a herd of about 2,000 pigs and they rush on off a cliff into the Sea of Galilee. So we know Satan is not going to be there, but who else isn't going to be there? Well, I'd first like to talk about a concept that is throughout the New Testament and, and in the Old Testament. There's four verses, but I'm only going to talk about two of those four verses. And, and the one I want to talk about is what Paul said. He was in trial before Felix, and the Jews were persecuting him and giving him a hard time, and he, he was on trial. And what did Paul said? He says, and I have the same hope in God as these men, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So when we were reading through Revelation, we heard that there's a first Revelation 20, there's a resurrection of the righteous, and a, right? A, a first resurrection. And so we have to figure out who's not taking part in that. Okay, so, so <clears throat> look what Jesus said also. Jesus said, but when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the blame, and the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. That's Luke 14, 13. So Jesus refers to it as the resurrection of the righteous. So there's, but do you know that there's no... Revelationist gives us a timing of this. Revelation 20. And it says, look at Revelation 20, verse 5. Revelation 20, verse 5. Some versions have got it in parentheses. It says, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. Well, who are those folks? Who are those that didn't come to life until the thousand years? We know we're there. We know we are priests. We know we're reigning with Christ. We're with him. Well, the Amplified Bible says it the best, and it says the rest of the dead, the non-believers, did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This coincides with Revelation 2, 7, and 8. Look at Revelation 2, 7, 8, a few verses down. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and gather them in battle, and number there like the sand of the seashore. So, Satan's going to gather a bunch of people, but who are they? They're the unbelievers. And we got another hint about who these people are. Look at, look at Revelation 26. Revelation 26 says, Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. What is this second death? Well, it's only talked about from two other places in the book of Revelation. And I want to read to you one of those places. Go to Revelation 21.8. Revelation 21.8. He says, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. So, who partakes in the second death? Not us. When we see Jesus coming and he takes, he brings us up. We're there forever. We don't have to worry about death again. We don't taste death again, but there is a second death for who? Well, it tells the qualifications for this. It says, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. That is the second death. So, to summarize, these are all the wicked people from the creation through the second coming who chose not to believe in God and serve him, including will be Cain, who killed his brother, those killed by the flood in Noah's time, those killed 
during the Sodom and Sodom Gomorrah deal where fire came out of heaven and consumed Sodom and Gomorrah during Abraham's time Pharaoh king of Egypt that wouldn't relent although God tried to get him to change his mind Ahab and Jezebel Haman who plotted the annihilation of the Jews during Esther's time Herod and Herodias who plotted John the Baptist's death Hitler, Judas Iscariot, and I'm sure you can think of many, many others. After the thousand years is over, those whose qualifications were stated back in Revelation 28, 1, 20, 21, 8 will take part in a resurrection that I don't think anybody really would want to take part in. They take part in a resurrection and Satan deceives them one last time and they go against the camp of God's people the city he loves and they try to attack it and let me read the the last verse that I'm going to share today Revelation 2 8 and 10 and Satan will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth Gog and Magog to gather them for battle notice this passage in number, they are like the sand of the seashore. Can you think of, you think of a, a beach that you've been to, and think about how many sand, how many how many grains of sand is there? It's a lot. God is trying to tell us something there. He's trying to tell us that there's going to be a lot of people that take part in this second death or this second resurrection. We take part in the first resurrections. We who overcome. We have to know that there's a line drawn, and there's a line drawn. There's not, in, in the scriptures, in the, there's not a mediocre in between. You're either in or you're out. And, and are we living our lives in such a way to project that we're in and make it attractive to other folks, that they can see our lives? Because there's a lot of people going to die. And, and God is trying to show us that, and John, John is trying to, John's trying to convey that through the book of Revelation. And I just want to give you the hope that that thousand years, we're going to be with Christ. We're going to be serving his as priest. We don't know exactly all that's going to be, but we're going to be there. We don't have to worry about death again. But there's a bunch of people that won't. They won't be there. And they'll be coming to life after that thousand years is over. And they'll meet their death and they'll not be with us in eternity. So I just want to encourage you to realize that God has put you here as an ambassador. And he's got great things for us. In that thousand years, we're going to see his face, and it's going to be great. And that's what our hope is, and that we would live our lives in an appropriate way, knowing that a lot of people are watching. A lot of people are trying to figure out what's right. Are we going to be there? Are we going to be, when people are messing up, are we going to be praying for them? Are we going to be doing our priestly duty? As Moses did, as Jesus does all the time, because he's interceding for us at the right hand of the Father all the time. Are we bringing people to the Father and representing people in matters of God? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this uh, time that you have, we've had together and your word. Uh, let it come from just a mind and a, a mental idea of about the principles and the storyline about, and let it go down into our lives and make our, our, our lives in such a way that people want to ask us questions and people want to learn from your word. And it's not all about us and I would never say it, it was. And we can't be righteous on our own account. It's only because of your blood that we're righteous. But help us to live a life worthy of your calling. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, 
Let's go ahead and uh, sing one more song.
Father, thank you for bringing us here today. Thank you for uh, your word and uh, the uh, prophecies of, of the future, Lord, told to us in the book of Revelation. Lord, we, we thank you for uh, your promises that you will take care of us and that you have prepared a place for us with you, Father. And we uh, praise you for uh, what you're doing in our lives. And we pray that uh, as we go our separate ways this morning, that you would bless us this week and uh, give us opportunities to uh, spread your gospel and uh, expand your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. Thank you online. You have a great day.